the music has stopped for Jack Ma. The most famous businessman China has ever produced has fallen from grace. He went from preparing to see one of his companies launch the biggest IPO the world has ever seen, to paying billions in fines and retreating from public view. His is a tale about the transformative power of tech and who gets to wield that power, but it's not his story alone. As our increasingly digital lives force governments around the world to find ways to limit the power of big tech over society and economy, China's own tech sector is facing a reckoning. We'll take a look at how Beijing is reining in its big tech in a bid to assert control at home while pushing to dominate the race for global technological superiority. All these companies have so much control over the daily activities of the citizens. It's part personal and it's part regulatory, but it's all about control. The Chinese government is very powerful. And we'll tell you why the rest of the world has to pay close attention. Are we going to act fast enough so that we can change the tide before it's too late? And we need to sort of stop looking at China as, you know, as a, as a non-problem. Let's start with Jack Ma. His meteoric rise over years and his spectacular fall within months mirrors the unbridled growth of China's tech sector and the now decisive moves to contain it. Longtime China watcher Clifford Kunin has followed that rise and fall. On April the 4th, 1999, Ma Yun, English teacher known to his foreign pen pals as Jack Ma, established Alibaba in a six-room apartment in Hangzhou in the east of China. Along with 17 friends and fellow students, he had an audacious goal. He wanted to remake the future of e-commerce in China. And spoiler alert, he succeeded. Just a quick side note. The 90s and the early 2000s was a period of rapid technological adoption in many places around the world. Let's not forget that eBay, Amazon, and Google were founded within years of each other. And in China, Alibaba wasn't the only tech titan to be born around this time. Tencent, which operates WeChat, the messaging app, and China's most popular search engine, Baidu, were also born in this era. But back to Alibaba. Alibaba's rise has helped along the way with big money from outside China. A $25 million investment from Goldman Sachs and Japan's SoftBank. They were betting on the rising consumer power in China. Alibaba debuts on the New York Stock Exchange. At the time, it was the biggest IPO in the world. It raised $25 billion and valued the company at a stunning $231 billion. In that same year, Alibaba creates a third-party payment platform called Alipay. It's kind of like PayPal, only you can do a lot more things with it. You can book taxis, order food, chat with friends. It got millions of users really quickly. Today, it has about a billion users. Jack Ma eventually spun off the app, brought it under a company called Ant Financial that was later called the Ant Group and made moves into more traditionally regulated industries like banking, insurance, and micro-lending. That notion of providing financial credit would later go on to make the government very nervous, but more on that later. The next few years saw Jack Ma and Alibaba march steadily towards new heights. A great, great entrepreneur, one of the best in the world, and he loves this country, and he loves China. I do, I do China and love America. From the initial mission of linking buyers and sellers on a platform, the company had grown into a technological behemoth touching nearly all aspects of everyday life. Alibaba's Singles Day on November 11 has become the world's biggest shopping event. Last year's shopping bonanza alone raised more than $74 billion for the company. Alibaba was suddenly everywhere in China. E-commerce, instant messaging, cloud computing, AI, fintech, entertainment and media. But beyond that, Jack Ma was also publicly adored. Jack Ma was a rock star, um, you know, in in the commercial equivalent of. Employees that are under Alibaba would say, oh, I cannot live any day longer without seeing Jack Ma. He was widely heralded as like a hero of modern China and everyone would call him, you know, Daddy Jack, right? And out of, of like genuine affection and respect. Jack Ma might have felt he could do no wrong, but on October 24th last year, at a meeting of Communist Party bigwigs and investment bankers from all over the world, he made a misstep. Jack Ma failed to read the room. He took aim at the old guard of Chinese finance, the state-run banks. He said they were stuck in their old ways of pledges and collateral and were stifling innovation. The government was less than amused and the response was swift. Jack Ma held talks with regulators and then he all but disappeared from public view. On November 3rd, just a little over a week after that infamous speech, the Ant Group IPO crumbled. The story goes that Chinese President Xi Jinping himself, furious at the speech, personally intervened to halt the IPO. 
It called to mind the old expression, two tigers cannot share the same mountain. Things didn't get any better for Alibaba and Jack Ma from there on. An antitrust probe concluded with a $2.75 billion fine for violating anti-monopoly rules. That's the largest antitrust fine ever handed down in China. But he's not the only one in the crosshairs of state regulators. As we all know, misery loves company. Right, so Alibaba might be the best known example, but there are certainly others. This is hardly a comprehensive list. Now, it's become known as the great rectification, as in the righting of past wrongs. But how much of it is just good economic sense? And how much of it is politically driven? Unsurprisingly, the views on this are mixed. The um, drive to regulate tech in China is, is produced by the security system in China, by the Communist Party state. They are very, very determined to control tech business and actual the functioning of tech for people and for companies in a way that um, is safe for the Communist Party state and its power so that nothing is ever challenged by the people in China. Mergers and acquisitions of these internet companies were not at all scrutinized in the past decade, right? Imagine that none of these uh, combinations were even looked at. That's not something you see in the West. So right now, when you have basically a period of very, very, very lax regulation, and all of a sudden it is now catching up to the, to the developed economies, then it feels like it's a crackdown, but I think there's a lot of argument to be made again, looking at the history, that this really is just bring China up to an international level. And I think um, in a way what the regulatory, um, what the regulators want to do is to kind of bring them back formally inside their respective sectors or get them to stick to their knitting, as we say in English. Um, and, um, <clears throat> um, but at the same time, you know, what that involves and what that entails is uh, establishing um, very clearly about who's in charge and who is accountable and that the government or the party actually have the first and final words on what's permissible. I believe some of these actions are actually long overdue. Um, you know, for instance, there have been a lot of complaints about the exclusionary practices in the e-commerce sector. Um, for instance, um, JD.com, which is a fierce competitor of Alibaba, have made a lot of complaints about Alibaba's and choose one from two business practice many years ago. Now, just for clarity, choose or pick one of two is a practice where Alibaba would force merchants to only sell their products on its platforms and not on its rivals. That, for obvious reasons, does constitute anti-competitive behavior. But several things can be true at the same time. That China is playing catch up after years of lax antitrust regulation while trying to assert the state's power over private enterprise and society, those things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. But questions around timing are unavoidable. First of all, the, the economy overall has slowed down. You see this entire uh, sort of difference in thinking of in the government and regulators about it's no longer growth at all costs. It's about managing the growth and stable growth, right? So internet companies in particular, like I said, have been seeping into these other sectors, not just, you know, online services, but lending and also education. And these are very, very important industries that pose especially on the credit side, potential systemic financial risk. The Chinese government now says if China's fintechs are going to lend like banks, then they should follow similar rules. In the case of Ant Group, it was able to loan out the equivalent of billions of dollars without needing to keep the capital reserves that banks do. That's just one example of how rules are changing in China, and at a faster clip than, say, the European Commission's efforts to regulate the likes of American tech giants. Tech companies um, like Google are fighting to but now with the commission in EU court, right? I mean, whereas in China, you know, Chinese antitrust authority can bring a case against Alibaba and can complete the case investigation in four months. And there's totally any challenge of the decision. So it's a very different dynamic in China uh, with all these uh, law enforcement actions. Um, and the government do have more leverage against businesses in China. In other words, the Chinese state has the power to do, well, nearly anything, really. But let's leave the government just for a moment and turn to the people. Increasing resentment towards internet and tech companies for various reasons, some call it the tech lash, has been a feature of the last few years in many countries. Guess where else? 
So before, you know, everyone was working really, really hard, you know, so-called 996, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week, and not complaining as much about it because they could see the, the potential wealth and potential growth that it was bringing. But now that that slowed down, they're basically like, why am I still working 996? That's actually probably one of the main reasons why Jack Ma really lost his popularity in China starting a couple of years ago, which is because he said 996 is a blessing. And he's not the only one to say that, by the way. Most of the top internet company leaders, including Richard Liu of JD, Lei Jun of Xiaomi, et cetera, they all said this. And, you know, they come from a different time in China's growth and development. But now you come to people born in the 90s, uh, you know, who are in their 30s, and they know nothing but prosperity in China. And so they want to have more choice. They don't want to just spend their lives overworking to quote unquote, make the capitalists even wealthier. A growing dissatisfaction with work culture is one, but it stands to reason that how the biggest tech companies operate in the country with the world's biggest population, with the world's biggest number of internet users has a big impact on wider society. But the notion that perhaps tech companies are too influential and know too much about their users is widely familiar. Now we've been saying that this is a story about power. And in today's digitalized economy, that means whoever holds the data holds the power. Here in Europe, that's the thinking behind the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR for short. It's aimed at giving consumers more control over their data and punishing companies that abuse the rules. China's Personal Information Protection Law, or PIPL, has similar aims. But it's not lost on observers that the biggest processor of data is in fact the Chinese state. And in terms of data protection, it might not practice what it preaches or seeks to enforce on private companies. It's the main privacy threat towards Chinese citizens or people who are outside of China by the Chinese government it's not the enterprises or the service providers, but the government itself. And this law, this data protection law in China, only governs the relationship between users and the service providers. That is, for example, if I'm a Chinese citizen and I'm using Alibaba, then it would be me and Alibaba. It's governing the relationship between us. But when it comes to if the government can have, the, have access to my data, regardless of if Alibaba wants to give it to them or if I want to give it to them, then the law actually has no jurisdiction over that. It actually has specific articles that says if the government wants it, they can still have it uh, out of like national security reasons or criminal prevent uh, crime prevention or criminal investigation and so on and so forth. Here's an emerging theme. Regulation is a necessary exercise in China like it is everywhere else. But the regulating state holds all of the cards and determines the game and make sure everyone plays it in the way it prefers. That said, time to check back in with a hero of our story. Jack Ma flew too close to the sun. To date, he's only been seen publicly once since he made his speech. Chinese social media users were quick to comment, saying Jack Ma appeared to have aged, linking his appearance to his difficulties with the government. He's been forced to step down as president of Hupan University, the business school he founded, as the state's push to limit Ma's influence spreads beyond the business side to cover his extracurricular activities too, making sure he toes the line. The current efforts to keep Chinese big tech in check aren't just aimed at making sure the firms don't do what the government doesn't want them to do. In fact, they're aimed at making sure that they do what the government does want them to do. I believe the tech firms, you know, given the current regulatory environment, will try to align themselves with the party's objective and trying to do more, to um, invest more in foundational science and technology. This is a way of self-protection for the firms. We're talking about AI, we're talking about autonomous car, we are talking about cloud computing, semiconductor. These are the type of essential foundational technology that the government desperately want at the moment. And it's these technologies that are at the heart of the race to dominate the digital global economy. What China does and how far it gets should matter to the rest of us. China is regulating its tech sector more tightly, hoping that will help it advance its goals within the country and help improve its competitive position abroad. But within that fairly straightforward sounding concept, 
is a mixture of views surrounding China's motivations and how it acts upon them. But the why and how surrounding China's treatment of its tech sector will leave its mark on the world. And especially experts in Europe are warning the continent could get left behind as China exports its tech around the world. Yeah, I mean, there's I think there is justification to the, to the argument that China wants to penetrate these overseas markets more and more. Um, that's part of its um, economic statecraft goals. You know, I'm actually more concerned about whether or not Europe is going to keep up. Because what I see here in Europe is a real almost refusal to invest in local startups, in local ideas. So, you know, what we need to do is, is to compete, to be really great, to be good and to stick to values. And this is a values question that we believe are good for people and good for society and good for human flourishing and ensure that there are options to China tech. And so that, you know, China doesn't just win everything because we have failed to keep up and we've somehow been, you know, um, consigned to the dust heap of history, if you like, because we haven't been energetic or entrepreneurial enough or the government has just refused to invest in, in, in enterprises that could be really amazing, but have never had a chance to, to grow and to flourish. To me, this is the really concerning aspect of the situation. How China advances its political and economic agenda domestically will shape it as a competitor and trading partner internationally. The rest of the world has to figure out not only how to keep up, but also how to define the race. A better understanding of what China does in this regard is key to the strategy. Thanks for watching. Now, if you enjoyed this video, you can watch other videos just like it on this playlist. See you soon.